Um, and now it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, award-winning poet Jose Alvarez. Jose's book of poems, Citizen Illegal, has been praised for a significant contribution to the literature that helps us understand the immigrant experience and Latinx identity. This book is personal and raw, offering an honest look at life as a first-generation American. Citizen Illegal was a finalist for the prestigious Penn Jean Stein Award and was named a top book of 2018 by NPR and the New York Public Library. Much more than words on a page, his poetry sparks insightful conversations and makes us think. I'm confident his presentation will do just that. So please join me in welcoming Jose Olivares to the stage. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. It is an honor and a joy to be here with all of you. Um, what do I want to say? Give me one second. All right, I think I'm good. Let's see. All right. Um, so uh, what I was thinking about and what I wanted to say, and I'll begin with this, good morning to all of you here, and of course, good morning to everyone watching over the internet. Um, I've been thinking very seriously about this responsibility, and so my plan today, if it's okay with all of you, is to primarily lean on poetry, which is what my practice is and which I think will kind of help tell the story that I want to tell. And over the course of reading the poems, I will uh, tell some stories to help give you the context that might help you appreciate why I wanted to read these particular poems in this particular room. Um, I've been tasked with offering today's keynote remarks for our diversity forum, and the theme of the conference, as you all know, is bridging the divide realizing belonging while engaging difference. That is a lot to process in an hour, and I feel confident that my keynote will not, will not answer all your questions. So if you were expecting to have all your questions answered, I apologize. I already know that I'm not going to do that. Um, what I do hope is that my keynote will entertain you first and inspire you to reflect on your own identities, and your own stories. I want to begin by confessing that I spent my younger years feeling out of place just about everywhere. I felt out of place in school with my friends in the neighborhood and with my family. Both of my parents migrated to the United States from Mexico before I was born, so I grew up speaking Spanish at home and learning English at school. Of course, it would be one thing if both languages were respected as equal languages, but growing up, that wasn't the case. English was the language of power. It was the language all the doctors spoke when my parents needed to go to the hospital. It was the language our lawyers spoke as they worked on my parents' citizenship status. English was the language my teachers used, and I learned that just speaking Spanish at school would get me funny looks or possibly, even or possibly even sent to the principal's office. Um, in Spanish, there's a saying that I wouldn't encounter until I was a teenager, but when I heard it, it felt like a perfect encapsulation of what I was feeling as a young person. Ni de aquí, ni de allá. Um, for those of you that don't speak Spanish, that phrase means neither from here or from there. To be Mexican-American felt like I was lost in an in-betweenness, and it wasn't just my American classmates I felt divided from. This is something that I think about a lot. We tend to think about stories of identity as the ways that we are distanced from other groups of people, right? People that share different identities than us. 
But those kinds of conflicts also separate us from our own people, from people that we have a lot in common with. I felt divided from my parents all the time. I struggled to understand why we ate food stamps nachos when my classmates could afford regular nachos, why we couldn't have Lunchables but relied on free lunch, why our Christmas presents came from the dollar store. At home, I couldn't ask, for my, I couldn't ask my parents for help with my homework. I felt deeply alone in that time. And so with that context, I want to read you some poems. And before I read you some poems, I want to ask you a question, which is, how many of you have been to a poetry reading before? Oh, wow, cool. All right, welcome. Uh, if you haven't been to a poetry reading, um, what I want to say to you is that generally we have this idea that poetry belongs in the library, that poetry is quiet, that you're not supposed to make noise, right? We teach poetry like it's an antique artifact, and if you touch it or look at it too long, it might collapse into dust, right? Uh, I was taught to read poems in the tradition of spoken word and poetry slam, and so the way that I was taught poetry was that poetry is alive, that it is present, that it is vibrant, that it is not just something that you listen to, but it is something that you kind of speak back to. So I want to say right now that you are allowed to make noise, right? You can snap your fingers if you feel so called to do so. Can we practice that real quick? Let me see you snap your fingers. Excellent. That's kind of like the classic response. It's not the only response, though, right? You can clap your hands. Let me see you clap your hands. I like that. That felt like a golf clap, but it's all good. <laughs> <clears throat> of course, you can laugh. Um, so I would say, you know, just relax. Like I said, enjoy yourselves. And with that, I'm going to read my first poem. This poem is called Mexican-American Disambiguation. It's after a poet named Idris Goodwin. My parents are Mexican who are not to be confused with Mexican-Americans or Chicanos. I am a Chicano from Chicago, which means I am a Mexican-American with a fancy college degree and a few tattoos. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. American colleges call them international students and diverse. My mom was white in Mexico, and my dad was mestizo, and after they crossed the border, they became diverse and minorities and ethnic and exotic. But my parents call themselves Mexicanos, who again should not be confused for Mexicanos living in Mexico. Those Mexicanos might call my family gringos, which is the word my family calls white folks, and white folks call my parents interracial. Colleges say, put them on a brochure. My parents say, ¿Qué significa esa palabra? I point out that all the men in my family marry lighter-skinned women. That's the Chicano in me, which means it's the fancy college degrees in me, which is also diverse of me. Everything in me is diverse, even when I eat American foods like hamburgers, which, to clarify, are American when a white person eats them and diverse when my family eats them. So much of America can be understood like this. My parents were undocumented when they came to this country. And by undocumented, I mean sin papeles. And by sin papeles, I mean royally fucked, which should not be confused with the American dream, though the two are cousins. Colleges are not looking for undocumented diversity. My dad became a citizen, which should not be confused with keys to the house. We were safe from deportation, which should not be confused with walking the plank, though they're cousins. I call that sociology, but that's just the Chicano in me, which should not be confused with the diversity in me or the Mexicano in me, who is constantly fighting with the upwardly mobile in me, who is good friends with the Mexican-American in me, who the colleges love, but only on brochures who the government calls non-white Hispanic or white Hispanic, who my parents call mijo, even when I don't come home so much. Wow. 
This next poem is a poem called Boy in the Belt. Um, this is a poem that I wrote about my dad, and you'll hear a lot of poems from my dad. And like I said, you know, one of the things that I found that I think surprises people because we're used to the conversation about immigration being, you know, one about the border in particular and not about everything that happens after migration is that people don't think about the way that these big socioeconomic events, these big kind of life changes impact our interpersonal relationships. And I think that I'm really interested as a poet in exploring the interpersonal and thinking about how that might teach us about, you know, bigger issues. So this poem is called Boy in the Belt. The belt is an extension of dad, and dad is an extension of God. The boy is an extension of dad, too. The belt is just one thread tying them together. The boy prays the belt stays wrapped around dad's waist. The belt does not believe in God, but if the belt did believe in anything, the belt would call it purpose. The belt began as skin on a cow. Its purpose was to protect, and it failed. The boy knows all about that. The boy has purpose too. Dad and God, and mostly he fails. The belt's new purpose is to hold, to contain dad's expanding waste except when the boy fights. Then the belt is born again as a classroom ruler with the day's lesson. Maybe the belt and the boy can rebel. The boy tugs at the thread that will bring dad and the belt. The boy won't lie about his bruised brother or call it anything noble. The boy fights because he is bigger. Dad says he has no choice. The belt says it has no choice. The boy understands he displeases God. When the belt meets the boy, the belt kisses the boy and leaves purple lipstick. Dad understands this as an act of love. The belt doesn't know about love. The belt knows it completed its job, and the boy hears love. This next poem is called River Oaks Mall. Um, I grew up in Calumet City, Illinois, which is in the south suburbs of Chicago. And uh, if you were from the, the south suburbs, or really probably even on the south side, far enough south, then you knew about River Oaks. Um, growing up, River Oaks Mall was like our social center. Uh, we didn't have much money, but we still went to the mall anyway just to kind of walk around and hang out because it's not like there were a ton of public places where teenagers could kind of congregate, right? Um, so I always knew that if I wrote a book, I wanted to include River Oaks Mall. So this is a poem called River Oaks Mall. It's hard to hold on to a secret whether or not anyone is looking. When the girl I have a crush on asks why I keep looking at her, I say, it's not like I like you, gosh. <laughs> Denial is one of the best ways to confess. When the teacher asks who brought beans for lunch, I blame it on the boy next to me. I bite my tongue when my stomach protests. Trying too hard is another way to confess. My family takes a Saturday stroll through the mall dressed in church clothes every other kid in jeans, t-shirts, and Jordans. Fun fact, when you have to try to blend in, you can never blend in. My dad gives me a penny to throw into a fountain that makes dreams come true. All my dreams except one. My family trying so hard to be American, it was transparent. All right, this next poem is called I Tried to Be a Good Mexican Son, and it's a true story. 
I continue to try to be a good Mexican son, sometimes to like varying results. Um, here we go. I tried to be a good Mexican son. I even went to college, but I studied African American studies, which is not law or medicine or business. My mom still loved me, so I invented her sadness and asked her to hold it like a bouquet of fake flowers. She laughed through it all. I didn't understand. Wasn't immigration a burden? What about the life you left, I asked my mom. She planted flowers, only building on the block with flowers. Foreclosure came like a cold wind. It took her flowers, but that was a season. New house, bigger garden. Mijo, go get some tomates from the yard is something my mom really says. I tried to be a good Mexican son. I went to a good college and learned depression isn't just for white people. I tried to be a good Mexican son, but not that hard. Sometimes my mom's texts get dusty before I answer. Even worse, I never share the Jesus Christ memes she sends me on Facebook. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. <laughs> if there is a hell, I'm going express. I hope they have Wi-Fi. I hope I remember to share my mom's Jesus Christ memes. Maybe God believes in second chances, but I doubt it. I tried to be a good Mexican son. I came home for the holidays, still a disappointment. No million dollar job or grandkids. Spanish deteriorating, English getting more vulgar. I tried to be a good Mexican son, but I kept fucking it up. My mom still loves me, even when I can't understand her blessings. She makes me kiss her on the cheek before I leave the house. She tells me to quiet down when she's watching her novelas. She asks me if I'm okay. She tells me I'm getting so skinny and I need to eat more frijoles. She has the pot ready. I try to be a good Mexican son, but all I know how to do is sit down for a good second and leave before a bad one. Okay. All right, uh, I'll read one more poem and then I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um, this poem is called, My Therapist Says Make Friends With Your Monsters. And going to therapy was really important for me um, because growing up I really believed deep inside somewhere that mental health issues were something that they were like upper class problems, you know what I mean? Like, my, you know, I thought about my family and I was like, my family, first and foremost, is concerned with like, do we have clothes for the winter? Do we have food to eat for everybody? We can't afford to have, you know, questions about mental health. Um, and then when I started going to therapy, I realized that my whole life, my parents would, would say that they had nervios, right? And I heard that word constantly, and I was like, oh, that's anxiety and maybe, you know, depression. Like, they had mental health issues, they just didn't have the language. Um, so this poem is called, My Therapist Says Make Friends With Your Monsters. We are gathered in truth because my therapist said it was time to stop running. And I pay my therapist too much to be wrong. So I am here. My monsters look almost human in the sterile office light. My monsters say they want to be friends. I remember when I first met them, me and my monsters. I remember the moment I planted each one. Each time I tried to shed a piece of myself, it grew into a monster. Take this one with the collar of belly fat, the monster called chubby, husky, gordito. I climbed out of that skin as fast as I could, only to see some spirit give it legs. I ran, and it never stopped chasing me, each new humiliation coming to life and following after me. 
After me, a long procession of sad monsters, each monster hungry to drag me back, to return me to the dirt I came from, ashes to ashes, fat boy to fat. My monsters crowd around me. My therapist says, I can't make the monsters disappear no matter how much I pay her. All she can do is bring them into the room so I can get to know them, so I can learn their names, so I can see clearly their toothless mouths, their empty hands, their pleading eyes. Angsty, so much angst. <laughs> um, so I wanted to tell you a story. And that story is that as a young person, I was so miserable um, when I was a teenager, probably like 14, 15, that I de devised a plan to move back to Mexico. I was convinced that if I lived in Mexico, my life would make sense in a way that it didn't make sense in the United States. And so, you know, my dad invited me to go back with him uh, to Mexico, and I went. And my whole plan was, when my dad got back on the plane to go back to the United States, I would just stay. I would live with my grandparents, I would finish school there, and it'd be cool. And I was so delusional that not, not only did I believe that I could do this, but I thought that when I stayed, there would be like, headline news, you know what I mean? Like, the local radio station would come up to my grandma's house and be like, we are here with, you know, the returned, kidnapped Mexican Jose Olivares. He is finally back from the United States where he belongs. And of course what happened was, uh, I was having a good time, but I remember hanging out with my cousins and I was like, wow, it feels so good to be home, you know? And they were like, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> they were like, you're not from here. You're from the United States. Like, stop talking crazy. Um, and I was so devastated. It, like, broke my little diasporan heart. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I, I tell you that story to kind of tell you that one of the ways, not just one of the ways, but how I found my way back to my family, to my people, to other people all around me, how I found my way really back to the world was through poetry. Um, my life changed when I discovered poetry. If this was a Broadway play, this is the moment where the lights would go dark and the spotlight would shine bright on me and Lin-Manuel Miranda would break into a rap song. <laughs> <laughs> would break into a rap song about the wonders of poetry. Uh, the real story is a lot less dramatic. It's a lot more regular. We had something called the Poetry Slam Club at my high school. And one day, we were given the option to either attend our seventh period class or go to an assembly featuring our Poetry Slam team. And I didn't know what Poetry Slam was, but I did know, but I did know what chemistry was. <laughs> and let's just say we had bad chemistry. I apologize, that's a bad joke. <laughs> so my plan was to go to the assembly, sit in the back, and crack jokes with my friends. And what I saw at that performance was something I had never seen. All of the adults were quiet while my classmates performed their poems. It was the first time I saw young people fully in command of a room. It was the first time I realized that people from my neighborhood could become authors, that we could be more than consumers. It was the first time I heard young people discuss sex and love and religion and family and race so publicly. Back then, we weren't given many opportunities to tell our own stories or give our opinion on current events. School was about memorization. We had to learn 
our times tables. We had to learn the Pythagorean the theorem. You can tell that I didn't study math, because like, those are the only two things I remember. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I had to memorize the times tables, and then I had to, there was the Pythagorean theorem, I remember that. <laughs> we had to memorize, you know, the periodic table of elements. We had to read books, but then we weren't, we were asked just to kind of report back what happened in the book. We had to, we had to memorize important dates in history and, and memorize the important people. Um, and so for me, it was really kind of life-changing to see that we could do more than just memorize information, that we could kind of be our own keepers of history. I started going to Poetry Slam meetings because I was desperate for a community. I was desperate for people I could talk to about more than sports. If you're like a young man, then you know, you kind of understand that Sometimes sports is the limit of what you're allowed to talk about. Um, through Poetry Slam, I met people like Diana Harris, my Poetry Slam teammate and a First Wave alum. Shout out to First Wave and everybody here with that program. I met Nate Marshall, who's a professor of creative writing here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I met Sydney Edwards, yeah, you can give it up for Sydney. <laughs> Sydney passed away unexpectedly recently, so I want to say I love you, Sydney, and thank you for being my friend. Uh, before she passed, when she found out I was coming here to give this keynote, she was super excited, and she told me that she couldn't wait to beat me at spades. Um, and she was probably right, although I, I would never tell her that in person. <laughs> this is how we got tight. Because of redlining in Chicago, the four of us lived super far south, and all of the poetry events were up north. And I'm not talking about Hyde Park North, I'm talking about Wicker Park North. That's a Chicago joke for those of you. <laughs> <laughs> Since I was the only one of us with the driver's license, I would drive to Diana's house, pick her up, and then we would drive to Nate's house and pick him up, and then we would drive to Sydney's house and pick her up, and the four of us would listen to music and talk and laugh all the way up to the north side. They were not my first friends, but they were so important to me. One of the reasons that I kept writing was to impress them to have something I could read in front of them at the open mics we would attend. And so with that, I'm going to read you some poems about friendship and family and love and kind of hopefully, hopefully the poems kind of show, I think, what it looks like to bridge the divide, what it looks like to really create um, solid friendships. And so this first poem that I'm going to read is called Getting Ready to Say I Love You to My Dad, It Rains. Getting ready to say I love you to my dad, it rains. I love you, dad, I say to the cat. I love you, dad, I say to the sky. I love you, dad, I say to the mirror. It rains and my mom's plants open their mouths. My dad stays on the couch. Maybe the couch opened its mouth and started eating my dad. I love you, Dad, I say to the couch, its tongue working my dad like a puppet. I hear the rain fall and think the city is drinking or making itself clean. I am here with my dad and the TV, and the TV drones on and on, so I'm not sure I hear it. My dad grunting and nodding, not the mushy stuff I was expecting. Neither of us cry, no hug or a kiss just a grunt and a nod. I love you, Dad, I say to my dad. We sit together and watch TV. Outside it rains. My dad turns the volume up. The city is drunk. The city is singing badly in the shower. I killed a plant once because I gave it too much water. 
Lord, I worry that love is violence. My dad is silent, and our relationship is not new or clean. I killed the plant once because I didn't give it enough water. My dad and I watch TV on a rainy day. We rinse our mouths with this water. So earlier I read you a poem called Boy in the Belt. And now I'm going to read you a poem called Poem to Take the Belt Out of My Dad's Hands. And one of the ways that as I continued to write, writing continued to change my life was that I began to see that it wasn't enough to write about kind of hard memories, but that for me, I wanted to try to write different possibilities for those memories and for those relationships. And so when I was younger, I was content to kind of write angry poems about my relationship for, with my dad, to kind of be angry and mad and blame him for what I perceived as like his failures, right? And as I kept writing, I was more interested in thinking about how we could continue to attempt to connect with each other, even given our differences. And so this is a poem like a rewriting of history. Poem to take the belt out of my dad's hands. In this story, he is wearing the belt instead of bringing it down. My ass stays soft. My head stays hard. In this story, the belt hangs in his closet. I snatch it and bury it. In this story, the belt acts alone. It is not his hands. He is watching TV, Sports Center, or whatever. He would stop the belt if he could. In this story, I grab the belt and beat myself with it. In this story, it is my own hands. His hands stay innocent. I stand above myself, and it is for my own good. In this story, I bury the leather belt in a cement coffin. I eat a whole cow and wear the skin like a luxurious silk. In this story, I am waiting for the whip. In this story, I am already crying. In this story, he doesn't reach for the belt. The belt is buried. He reaches for my head and rubs it soft. He says it's okay. In this story, there is no but. This story ends here. My dad, me, still under his hands, still crying. All right, a few more poems, and then I'm super excited uh, to be in conversation with a couple of students from the First Wave program to take some of your questions. Um, this poem is one I wrote for my mom. It's called An Almost Sonnet for My Mom's Almost Life. Give me one sec. Oh, here it is, 36. The poem mentions Marco Antonio Solis, who's my mom's favorite rock star. Just some context. An almost sonnet for my mom's almost life. In the life where my mom never has kids, she doesn't mourn. She spends her 20s following Marco Antonio Solis, show to show, hands up in surrender, in praise to a different God than the one she spends Sundays kneeling to now. I love imagining her like this. Her name, Maria Maria, a name the men cursed to the heavens, from Guadalajara to Oaxaca, holy name of the mother, reborn a mother to none. She babies herself, and maybe some lucky men, but only for a minute. Oh, I know my mom would protest, she would be bored without my family and God. My brothers blasting rap music in the basement, smoke reddening their eyes. 
Do our bellies of joy give joy to our maker? Reader, I am a parent to nothing, not even a plant. All I know is those Saturday mornings, I've shared a coffee with my mom while love songs play on the radio, and she stirs her coffee with her eyes closed, dreaming of a life where her smiles are her own and only her own. Um, this next poem is called Ojalá, Me and My Guys. And this is a poem that I wrote during quarantine um, because, like probably many of you, uh, during the first couple of weeks, my friends and I set up like Zoom happy hours and we checked in. And when it became clear that the pandemic was going to extend indefinitely, uh, very quickly, our Zoom happy hours went from like very happy and optimistic to like, this is the most depressing thing. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really want to be on Zoom anymore. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna lie to you and tell you that I'm doing okay. Um, and so one of the ways that we found to continue to talk to each other um, is we, we started playing video games together over the internet. Uh, so this is a poem about some of those friendships. Ojalá, me and my guys. Me and my guys need an excuse to talk. One of them sends me a mic so we can play video games. We make group chat after group chat so we can talk about basketball. We're good at reciting stats, good at sharing rap songs, good at cracking jokes, good. My homies are always good when I ask, and I don't ask often enough. Cool. And then along the same line, this is a new poem. This poem is called Bucket Boys. Uh, my favorite game to play online is NBA 2K, uh, which is a basketball game. Um, and I play that game with some, like, with some people that I know in real life, but also some people that I've only met through the game. Um, so this poem is about that. It's called Bucket Boys. On the game, my guys chirp about summer. One wants to go bird watching. Another has a sick son. One has his mic off the whole game. Who are these men whose avatars stay clean shaven day after day, not a shadow, not a shadow, one takes care of his father, another has three kids, one I've known since our parents brought him home from the hospital, before memory. My wife sends them greetings over my microphone. Two work in recruiting, one in retail. Before the start of each game, we say what's up, we laugh, we sky, we hook, we teeth. One got chased by a gang one night, one lost a homie, and then another homie. He got on the mic and told us he loved us. It was my first time hearing him. Cool. All right, a couple more poems. Um, this next poem is called Nate Calls Me Soft. This poem was inspired by my friend Nate calling me soft. <laughs> I try to get real creative with my titles. <sighs> Nate calls me soft. If we were better at being honest, maybe it wouldn't take a bottle of something strong to make us talk straight. Straight edge as we used to be, driving around in that old Toyota Tercel from open mic to open mic. If I confess that the memory alone makes the corner of my eye itch, would you call me soft? Nate says, yes. <laughs> B says, duh. Adam says, you were the softest. My therapist says, let's talk about your parents. My brothers say, 
If all you're going to do is talk, then pass the blunt. <laughs> Mexican Jesus says nothing. Mercury is in reggaeton. <laughs> Do the stars only talk to women? Tonight, the stars are hidden by the brash lights of the city, and I want to say my friends can see my softness through all the jokes I crack. But maybe I don't need the stars to be tender. Maybe the next time I see you, I'll slap away the dap, pull you in close, and tell you under the ordinary street lights how much I love you and that you still ain't shit. I like that poem. <laughs> um, all right, I'll read two more poems. And then, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you all for being here. Thank you all for engaging in these conversations, not just here with me, but you know, in all of the breakout sessions and beyond. Um, I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. This next poem is called, No More Sad Mexicans. If I can find it. Here we go. No more sad Mexicans. Where are all the Mexicans who aren't going to heaven? Tell them to bring their dickies and their slides and their rosary beads and all their heartbreak and all their primos, y primas, y primes. Tell them to leave their flags and bring a six-pack or something to throw on the grill. All the sad Mexicans are at work making us proud. They're washing dishes or driving trucks cross-country or talking shit at a construction site. What about those Mexicans who work as police officers? Fuck those Mexicans. Apologies to all of the sad Mexicans I know and all of the sad Mexicans I've been, but I can't write another poem where we show up to work at the steel mill for 20 years straight with no days off just to get laid off on a Wednesday by a man with more mustache than face. This one is for my homie Josefo, who never plays a song made after 1988. Tell that fool Javier he can come, but if he, kicks, if, but if he gets kicked out of the bar, he's on his own. Tell Danny he's not allowed to talk about capitalism for 24 hours. <laughs> Even my mom is playing flip cup and taking shots. Tell God they're invited, but only if they drop the self-righteousness. We get it already. You brought us into this world, and whatever, homie. We hired a taquero for the next few hours, and I promise his tacos de asada are the best tacos south of, S of Sibley Boulevard. If you don't know where Sibley is, tell Nate and Eve to give you their tour of the south side beginning with Cal City. Tehran hit my line and told me all of the Cal City homies are tired of reading poems where we get our homes foreclosed. Tehran said, Tell them about the night we drank Incredible Hulks in a basement bar in Hammond and danced and sweat until the sun cussed us out. I keep writing poems that begin with the wilting, that live in the wilting, erasing the bloom. This one is for the day we survived. This is for the darkness we turned into a dance floor. This is for all the sadness we carried and the homies that helped us carry it. The caring only gets heavier. Therefore, the law of physics requires us to love even harder, celebrate louder. You know the joke about Mexicans crying. What's that? How do you know when a Mexican is about to cry? How? When they crack a joke. Ha ha. All right, 
I'll end with one more poem. Um, so uh, one of the, what do I want to say? When you're a poet, there's like a few different times that you get called on to like jump into action, right? And one of those times is when people get married. Then suddenly everybody's like, oh, Jose, you're a poet, right? Do you, uh, do you want to write us a poem? <laughs> and um, whenever I get asked to write a poem for a wedding, I always say yes, um, because I am a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I, I really, I love love, and um, I just feel so honored when people ask me um, so this poem is a poem that I wrote for my friend's wedding, uh, which happened a couple weeks before my own wedding. So this poem is called Let's Get Married. It's for Allison and Nate on the occasion of their wedding, and always for my wife, Erica. Let's get married. Let's get married on a Tuesday with the six-piece from Heralds as our witness. Let's get married at noon and then again at 3.30 when the school day lets out and a whole block of dandelions flower our ceremony. Let's get married under a full moon and then again under a new moon so every celestial being can witness our vows. Love, one wedding isn't enough for me. I want to propose again and again on a Wednesday because you did the dishes. On a Thursday, because we woke up next to each other again, say yes, say less. I'll be on one knee asking to share in the delight of knowing each other. Let's get married because Chicago, because St. Louis is a city on a map, because your name is my favorite word. Let's get married because there are vows we can only make in the dark, because we don't need a witness to say I do. Let's get married because it's raining, and that's supposed to be good luck. Mi amor, mi cielo, mi vida. Let's get married in every language we can and can't speak, under every God, my God. The way you look at me is a miracle I believe in, because we get one life, one. Say yes, then say yes again. Let's get married after we get married. Because underneath every word I write, there is one word I carve onto every desk, one word I tag onto every building, on every block of my heart. Marry me, make me, no, not complete, but a little more alive than I've ever been. So with that, I want to invite Caleb and Dia up to the stage. Um, yeah, thank you so much for everything. I think I'll take this seat so you two can take these microphones. Word. Check, check. Check, check, check. Bet. Thank you for that. That was amazing. Um, it's an honor to have you. Um, my name is Caleb Bartman. I am a first wave scholar, 14th cohort. Um, I, what else are we supposed to say? Uh, major. Uh, yeah, I study sociology and legal studies. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation with y'all. And my name is Dia Abbas. I use she, they pronouns. I'm a first wave scholar, a foreign language acquisition scholar, majoring in English creative writing, South Asian studies, class of 2025, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, I'm from the best country in the world, Chicago. Hey. Um, here he go, right, here he go. Right. I love it. Uh, we will be asking Jose Olivares a few questions, and then we will give you the opportunity to ask him questions as well. Be sure to scan the QR code to ask your questions at any time. So Jose, you've touched on this a little bit already, but I'm wondering, how does poetry serve as a tool for us to transmit our stories out of silence? As bilingual speakers, how can we use English specifically, carefully enough, that utilizes the privilege of this Western tool? 
That's a good question. I'll begin with kind of the second part, which is about using English specifically. And I think that question of English is different for each of us, right? For those of us who are bilingual, depending on what our second language is. My second language, really my first language, is Spanish. And there was a time where I felt very, um, where I was very precious and protective of Spanish. But the more I studied and the more I learned, the more I realized that Spanish is also a colonial language, also a language of power. And so there's always different relationships at play. Um, I think for me, one of the powerful things about using English is that I really believe that poetry is for everybody, right? And using English is a way that I can connect with people where I'm at, right? And so because I'm rooted in communities in the United States, it means that I can go to a class, a high school classroom anywhere in the country and immediately make a connection with those students. And so for me, there's something powerful in that. Um, and it's also important, I think, that we continue to preserve languages and continue to find ways. I don't think that, you know, like one of the things that I always think about is, for me, when I was a young person, I wasn't given a choice between languages. I didn't choose to kind of become a primary English speaker. I had to because that was the language of power. And if I had chosen to speak Spanish, my life outcomes would have been drastically different, if that makes sense, right? And so I believe that people should be given the choice to express themselves in whatever languages they feel most comfortable in. To answer the first question, the first part of your question about using poetry to move out of silence, for me, what poetry gave me the space to do was really consider myself with the level of thought and depth that I had not been given the opportunity to do so before that. And so if you ask my teachers before I started writing poetry, they would have all told you that I was a really quiet and shy kid. And what I learned was that I was only quiet and shy because I thought that, you know, that was what was expected of me and not necessarily because that's what I wanted to be. And poetry gave me the opportunity to consider that I might want to be something different. And I, you know, I don't think that it's special to poetry. I think that if you're given a chance to consider yourself and to really interrogate yourself, that you might come to similar kind of answers about yourself, whether you know, you're a visual artist, someone who works in sculpture, someone that works as a journalist, all of these different fields of study can give us a chance to reflect in a way that is really meaningful. Word, thank you for that. Um, you said that your poems are an attempt to make beauty out of a situation or to create something new. How, do you, how does this approach to poetry extend to your views on life and or diversity? Yeah. So, for me, I guess one of the conflicts that I navigate as an artist and as a person in the world is how do I continue to stay engaged with all of the violences and oppression that exist in society, that exists in my community? How do I stay engaged and not ignore it while also, at the same time, trying to imagine different possibilities so that these kind of corruptions and oppressions don't stay repeating, right? Um, and so for me, I mentioned it in my poems about my dad, like it has been very meaningful to me and I think to our relationship that we don't have to be angry with each other, that we can kind of imagine something different for our relationship. And I think it is a meaningful practice, both as a creative person and as a person living in the world, to 
remember that just because the world as it exists as it does now doesn't mean that it has to exist that way forever, right? There's no natural law to the society that we've created. All of this is man-made. And so writing is another way to kind of interrogate and challenge those structures. And I think it reminds me and gives me the courage to, to kind of interrogate those structures beyond writing. That's beautiful. Um, you've touched on this also about this idea of reimagining and rewriting history through the page and the stage. Um, I also come from a poetry slam background. So my question is, how do we reconcile the relationship between storytelling and trauma in a world that wants to commodify our stories and simplify our truths without further action? In addition to that, to you, how does translation and writing work as action and activism? Your questions are so good, both of you. Um, all right, hold on. Read the first question one more time. Most definitely. <laughs> How do we reconcile the relationship between storytelling and trauma in a world that wants to commodify our stories and simplify our truths? Yeah. So first, I think it's true that the world wants to commodify our stories, but it's not just that they want to commodify our stories, but that it's particular stories of ours that are more viewed as more valuable than others. And I think you're right to say that it's often those stories of trauma. Um, growing up in the poetry slam, I quickly realized that if I wrote like a goofy poem about Calumet City, Illinois, and hanging out at the mall with my friends, people would be like, you know, that was good. But the second I said immigration, they were like, yo, that's deep, that's... <laughs> and, but it, it got even, you know, it's even deeper than that. When I went away to college, um, I took a creative writing class, and what I found is that it didn't matter what I wrote about. I, I went to college up at Harvard in the Northeast, and if I wrote, you know, like, it's very beautiful in the fall there, right? And so if I wrote a poem about the leaves changing colors, people, my classmates would be like, it's really powerful the way you write about the trees as a metaphor for migration. <laughs> they were like, you know, the leaves having to assimilate with the culture. And I was like, I'm literally just writing about the trees. <laughs> and so I mean, so I think there's a couple things, right? One is that as artists, we have to understand that sometimes, no matter what we create, it will be read through the lens of our identity, that some people are not actually reading what we write, they're reading what they know about us as autobiography, right? Um, and then the other thing is that there is, that, that there is um, a com commodification of these stories of trauma, and then we have to ask ourselves, you know, why are those stories sought after? And does it actually, are these stories contributing towards the liberation of the people that I love? Are they contributing towards, you know, some widening of imagination, of possibility for my people? Or is it really just something that people can watch or listen to and feel good about, and then kind of continue on in the same old, same old. Um, and for me, you know, it's important not to, I really believe in kind of disrupting those usual patterns. It's why when I write about immigration, I'm interested in the intimate as opposed to just the moment of crossing. Um, and then to answer your second question, which I've already forgotten, Will you remind me? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, to you, how does translation work as activism? Yeah. Um, I think translation can be very powerful, in part because I remember when I was growing up that, for example, none of my books were translated, and so I couldn't share any of what I was learning with my parents. Um, and so to be able to write books and poetry that get translated that not only can I share with my parents and have them read what I'm writing, but that other families like mine might be able to share and discuss together, 
I think kind of, I think it just broadens the potential impact. And so for me, that's important. And it gives people a choice. It, gives, it reminds them that these languages are not, that you have a choice in how you want to read and how you want to consume. And you don't have to be reading in English only in order to be like a person of academia. Word, yeah. I know when I picked up uh, your newest book, uh, Promises of Gold, um, I picked it up on the uh, uh, Spanish side. So I called Dia, was like, Dia, this is like all in Spanish. How am I gonna get through this? So <laughs> um, thank you for uh, incorporating both, um, both home. Um, in writing about your family and experiences in America, you often lean uh, to humor uh, to make a point. What role, and I think this is also as a Chicagoan or an adopted Chicagoan, I don't know how you feel about that, being from Calumet, are you a Chicagoan or not? I mean, this is, this is like a very existential question, okay. you know? I don't want to get uh, in trouble with people that are from the city, so I always say I'm from Calumet City. Yeah. We'll adopt you. We, we. <laughs> uh, what, what role do you see humor as having um, in talking about contentious or difficult issues? I think humor is wildly important to me for a number of reasons. One is that Growing up, my family and my brothers, whenever there was a difficult conversation, they would immediately turn to jokes. Um, like, it's probably unhealthy the way that we kind of deflect from issues at hand to crack jokes. Like, I remember one time one of my younger brothers was going through like a devastating breakup, and he messaged our group chat and he was like, yeah, I'm not doing too great. And the very next message was like, all right, back to the jokes. Um, but I think there's something powerful in, in humor in the way that it adds a different text. And also because humor is like a refusal to give in to kind of the pessimism of a situation. Humor is a way at its core to say, to kind of regain power in a sense, right? To say, yeah, all of this is messed up and I still know enough to laugh about it and find a way out anyway, right? Um, and so there's a refusal inherent in humor that I find really powerful. And then, you know, I would agree with you. I think that it also comes from where we grew up that, you know, people in Chicago are like the funniest people to me in the creation of language. And, and I, for me, it feels very natural to turn to that instinct. Okay, bear with me. I got another long question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a first-generation immigrant and student at an institution like UW-Madison, I often feel the conflicting pressure to be invisible while also standing representative of an entire group of people. I think about how the form of poetry is finding control of where and how to use silence, sound, and space. What do you think is a transformative nature of the poem that compels so many of us to use the page and the stage as a tool for re-envisionment and reckoning. Yeah. I love the way you put it, right? Silence, sound, and space. I think one of the reasons why so many of us turn to poetry and continue to turn to poetry is that compared to other artistic disciplines, poetry is pretty accessible, right? If you want to be a visual artist, you need paint, you need canvas. You know, if you're a, a, someone who works in sculpture, you need objects to kind of mold and you need, you know, I don't even know the name of the tool, but uh, you need like hammers and chisels like all of those could be cost prohibitive. Um, even if you're a writer of a, dis of a different discipline, to become a novelist, you need access to time and space that you might not have, right? To write a novel is kind of a long process. Whereas to write a single poem is something that you just need, you know, I'm not saying that all poems are fast, but 
within a day you can write a poem and feel something, right? Gain something from that instinct. So part of it, I think, is that, that poems are small and accessible in a way. Um, but the other reason, I think, is because poetry has movement built into it, right? For me, the most important part of a poem is what we call a volta. And so for those of you who aren't English majors, the volta is the turn of the poem, right? It's the moment where something changes and there, you know, not necessarily you get like a revelation, it could be a revelation, but the moment where something within the fabric of the poem changes and you kind of move in a different direction, right? It's the turn. Um, and so for those of us who share different identities with various struggles, it can feel like we're kind of living in that base of the poem. And, and poetry has this volta built in where we can turn and, and that turn compels us to find something else, to kind of move in a different direction than what we've been stuck in. And so maybe that's part of it too. The other thing is that within poetry, we just have really great role models. I mean, I think, you know, for me, you know, I want to think about the generation before me. So people like Araceli Skidmai, people like Natalie Diaz, people like Patricia Smith, um, people like Martin Espada, um, people like Terrence Hayes, people that are already giving us a model for how we can possibly do this, how we can kind of construct something new from the old traditions. And I think that challenge is one that feels particularly exciting. It feels in line with you know, some of the challenges we face as politically engaged people, which is given the limits of democratic society, how do we still take those limits and find a way to construct something new? Yeah, thank you for clap it up for that. <laughs> now I'll add um, somebody who taught on this campus, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, and uh, and her work is I know deeply influential for those of us from Chicago. Um, in your book, um, in this poem, Fathers, you write. Um, I should apologize. It's true, my dad stopped hugging me, but I never say the other part. I stopped hugging him too. Um, when I read that, it kind of put, you stabbed me in my heart when I read <laughs> that because I was like, yeah, we, we talk about um, one part of the story, but um, we don't talk about the difficult conversations that we have with ourselves. Uh, so my question is, how do you think art helps us have difficult conversations with ourselves? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, how does art help us have different, difficult conversations with ourselves? I think the first part of that is that you have to be willing to engage with yourself in that way. I don't think that just being an artist inherently makes us like somehow more spiritually or emotionally in touch with ourselves because we have this practice. I think we can delude ourselves into thinking that we are having difficult conversations with ourselves when really we're just telling the comfortable parts of a story. And so I think in order to really have those difficult conversations with ourselves, we have to be actually willing and wanting to confront those difficult questions. And I think if you meet that requirement, if you want to have those difficult conversations with yourself, if you're interested in the process of growth, which sounds very charming and nice, but is oftentimes actually very painful and hard, then, um, then art can be a way to do that because it's, it gives you a structure. Again, it gives you a structure, and that structure is one that you can mess with. In that poem that you read, I'm kind of interrupting the poem in a way to give, the, give you this confession. And I think that, you know, whether you're following a particular form of poetry, if it's the sonnet or the villanelle, poetry offers us structures and then the instinct as an artist is to break that structure and in breaking that structure, you might find yourself confronted with one of these difficult moments or difficult confrontations or difficult questions. 
Yeah, I know we have some more questions coming from the audience. Um, while we get those, at one point you say something about healing in um, a few of these poems. Can you talk about that and art in it as healing? Or is it healing? Um, I know you, you kind of had some thoughts about that in your work. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that you hear people say is that art is therapy, um, that writing is therapy. And what I found is that that is absolutely not true, that art can be therapeutic, that it can help you move some of those emotions around in a way that feels good and is useful. But therapy is therapy, right? And that's the only thing that is therapy is therapy. Um, yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> um, and so we're kind of lying to ourselves if we think that we are smart enough and brilliant enough that we're capable of doing all of this healing on our own. I think actually, you know, the question of healing is something that is communal and it requires other people. And sometimes those people need to be professionals who are trained in a particular field. And so um, I think that poetry, there's definitely been poems that have changed my life. There's poems like Like You by Roque Dalton that I carry with me everywhere. There's poems by Miss Brooks that I carry with me. But only therapy is therapy is what I would say. Thank you for answering our questions, Jose, genuinely. Uh, we will now read the viewers' questions. So this first question says, did you ever have anyone on your journey, other than your therapist, acknowledge your mental health and or emotions? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I think that As I continued to grow, one of the things that I found was it went from a place where it felt very taboo and unmasculine to talk about my feelings to all of a sudden, you know, I got like a lot of props and respect. People were like, wow, he's so in touch with his feelings. You know what I mean? Like women in particular were like, but like, wow, like, you know, you're so great. Like, how did you do that? And, it, and so I think, again, there's these kinds of pitfalls where you can kind of sort of start to believe the hype yourself. You know what I mean? And so I think there, there was an acknowledgement by several people of my emotions or mental health. And I think, you know, Sometimes it was like unnecessarily positive, if that makes sense. All right, we got two more questions for you, Fran. Um, what advice would you have given your parents for them to help you, help you navigate your American citizen son of immigrants identity when you were younger? That's such a great question. I mean, I don't know. It, it's, Difficult because I think one of the things that helps me move with more compassion towards them now is really understanding just how difficult a position they found themselves in. You know, not only were they new to the United States themselves and trying to navigate this new country themselves, not only were they new parents, which is like a whole other thing, they were also very young. They also had limited funds to do all of this. They didn't. They didn't have access to a lot of things, and so they were really kind of making it up as they went. And given that, you know, they tried their best. I think the advice that I would give them is just to, you know, continue to like love my siblings and I and to ask us questions and not give up when we kind of turn away in those moments when we turn away and to, to kind of trust us to, to, to find our way back to them. But it's such a difficult situation. Mm. That's a beautiful answer. I really resonate with that. Um, and the last question is, what are you currently focusing on or exploring through your poetry? Yeah. 
right now I'm writing a novel, um, which is, oh, cool. <laughs> um, the novel is a reverse migration story. So it begins in Chicago and follows two friends through the American South and into Mexico. Um, and I'm writing it um, because, you know, to your question about the com commodification of our stories, mm -hmm. you know, I got tired of people asking me for immigration stories because immigration stories kind of make certain assumptions about us. And one of those assumptions is that the global south is a place to be left, is a place where all the problems exist, and that the United States is where all of the answers exist. And so I wanted to tell a story about what might happen if someone actually has to leave the United States in order to find the answers they're looking for. Um, and so that is what I'm at work right now. It's difficult because I'm not a novelist, but <laughs> you know, novelists write a whole lot more than poets do. So it's requiring me to learn a different type of discipline than I've had to access before. So I'm excited. Um, I love a new challenge, but it's, it's also something that is a little scary too. Mm. Thank you so much, Jose. I'm gonna go off script and add one final question. Um, you talk a lot about migration. You talk a lot about home. Um, as a black Chicagoan, we know the great migration and where that for black folk um, in the North, for your own family history, um, how do we build solidarity, international solidarity with folk who are going through um, forced displacement, mm -hmm. um, people that are, uh, may not have home as they knew it? Um, how do we build solidarity through our art, through our community building? That's a great question. And it's not one that I know the answer to. I can tell you how I'm thinking about it, which is that when I was younger, when I was in my 20s, what I thought was rather than creating my identity around some nationalist identity, right? Because you know, I was learning how all governments, all, you know, nation states contribute to the oppression and to the violence against some people, right? Like, it's not like I could just be like, well, I'm Mexican and therefore innocent from all structural violence in the world because, you know, Mexico as a nation state, you know, has huge problems, whether it's Again, with violence against women, whether it's, you know, violence against migrant people that are moving up through Central America and South America to get to the United States, whether it's, um, you know, uh, yeah, or violence against indigenous people and the indigenous people of Mexico. Um, and so it's not like I could just pretend to be innocent in any way in that by like clinging to a nationalist identity. So then I thought, what if I really just ground myself in the local? What if I say, you know, you said Chicago is a country, right? And I really was like, what if I'm just like, my country, my place of origin is Chicago, and what I will kind of, I'll just sink my hands into the dirt in Chicago and do whatever work I can there, and then kind of, you know, not necessarily pretend that the outside world doesn't exist, but really just try to be hyper-local about my solutions. And I think there's value in, in, in an ethic like that. But where I'm at now is like, for me, I consider myself a child of migration. And so I know that there is no end to migration in a sense, because there's nowhere on earth that is safe for us to arrive at. And so given that, how do we under, like, if I understand myself as someone who is a child of migration, how do I build bridges and connect with other people who are migrating for whatever reasons they're migrating, right? And that includes people that are migrating now from the north of the United States back to the south of the United States, right? We know that in Chicago there's been great displacement of black Americans. Um, 
but also with people that are migrating for climate change reasons, that are migrating because of fear of um, religious persecution, for all of these different reasons. How do we, how do we build, how do we understand that one, migration is natural, and then two, how do we support people in their status as migrant people? And so those are some of the questions that I'm kind of thinking about. Um, and it requires me to be in solidarity with all of these different people in a way that when I was just focused in Chicago, I could be like, well, that's a, you know, that's a New York issue. That's a Central American issue. Like, I'm really just thinking about Chicago. So it's asked me to kind of widen my perspective in a sense. That's all the questions we have for you, Jose. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, so Thank, much you. For Thank you both for your questions. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Kevin. Wow, how powerful was that? That was amazing. Um, let's give one more round of applause for our brilliant scholars, Dia, Caleb, and Jose Olivares. Um, you know, I really appreciate you showing us, you know, how we can bridge the divide through family, through love, through friendships, and how poetry and storytelling um, can really allow us to be keepers of our own history. So powerful, it enables us to imagine different possibilities. I love the question, you know, Caleb, I get a chance to work with Caleb a lot, and that question got me. How does art help us to have difficult conversations with ourselves, right? What is our appetite for personal growth? And what are the means and mechanisms by which we can explore that so that it will enable us to more effectively bridge the divide and engage in diversity and difference? Uh, thank you so much uh, again, Jose Olivares, um, and to our student moderators. Um, I'm inspired hearing such an open and honest conversation or discussion around the very real emotions and emotional issues that, um, that really are impacting us in so many different ways and impacting our community. So I truly feel that these ongoing conversations are helping us uh, to bridge the divide. What do you all think? Yeah? Yeah.